It sounds paradoxical, but the intense and painful experience of shame arises out of our evolved brain, designed to help us belong, fit in and stay safely in the group. Shame was designed to help us to establish and maintain our social place and position. And it guides us to interact and cooperate with others in a way that benefits us and the group, and ultimately the survival of our species. Huh. Hi, I'm Dr. Stan Steindl, and I thought today I would do a brief explainer of the evolutionary and biopsychosocial model of shame and shame memories. Very keen to hear what you think about all this. I just find it so interesting. Professor Paul Gilbert, the founder of Compassion Focus Therapy, has written extensively on the topic of shame, including a recent chapter called The Evolution of Shame as a Marker for Social Security, a biopsychosocial approach. This chapter appears in the book The Self Conscious Emotions. Theory and Research by Tracy, Robbins and Tangney in 2007. I'll put a link to this book in the comments below. So the model goes something like this. We are born in a terribly, terribly vulnerable state. We need to be cared for and looked after to survive. A baby's cry is their superpower. You know what it's like when you're wandering along, minding your own business, and then you hear an infant's cry. We all turn our heads. So from day one, it's imperative that others feel positively towards us, motivated to connect with us and to look after us. When we're babies, we mainly do that by looking adorable and then crying when we really need something. As we mature, our brains are designed to develop certain social motives and competencies of self-awareness, self-monitoring and self-evaluation, still designed to help us stay safely in the group. This is all that first aspect of the model. The second aspect of the model is that we live in social contexts, not least the context of family and caregivers, but also the broader social cultural context, which might have certain opportunities and threats, rules and structures, all of which shape us, our self identities and our sense of our place in the group. And so with our innate needs to be accepted and maintain our place safely in the group and our competencies of self awareness and self evaluation, coupled with the social cultural context in which we're born, grow up and live. We're vulnerable to having a range of personal experiences of being shamed. Perhaps we have shame experiences in the family or from caregivers, such as criticism, hostility, neglect or abuse, or perhaps it's in our wider social world of peers, teachers, coaches, etc such as bullying, exclusion, discrimination or ridicule. Out of all of that, we can develop external shame or our sense of existing in the minds of others, not as positive or attractive or loved, but as inadequate, unworthy and unlovable. The world and especially the people in it are seen as unsafe, rejecting and isolating. We feel under social threat. But we need to stay safely in the group. Our evolved brains demand it. And so we engage in certain defensive responses. One option is the submissive response, judging and blaming ourselves and appeasing others and making efforts to reduce the risk of harm from others. We develop internal shame and a belief that we are in fact, inadequate, unworthy and unlovable. This is a defensive response because judging and blaming ourselves feels safer than judging and blaming others who might be more socially powerful and retaliate or harm us. Internal shame is painful, 
but it aids in our survival. Alternatively, we might respond with aggression, especially when submission is seen as even more dangerous. Here we develop humiliation, which is more about the other being bad, and we feel slighted or wronged and we seek revenge. And so anger is a common emotion in the context of humiliation, along with a desire to right the wrong or defend our reputation. How dare you treat me this way? Humiliation is still painful, but it motivates us to fight for our position in the group. Whether the defensive response is submissive or aggressive, internal shame or humiliation really depends on a whole range of factors. Historical, contextual, immediate factors or social, psychological, even genetic and biological factors. We have tricky brains. And of course, sometimes shame can be felt by association with another who is shamed. The risks to their social place and safeness in the group reflect onto us. Often this can arise out of relational, social or cultural norms such as honour or saving face. Here we experience reflected shame. I've had the great honour recently of helping write a chapter for a book. The lead author is Dr. Marcella Matosh from the University of Coimbra, who I mentioned in my last video, Shame Memories and How to Help Them. The chapter is also written with Paul Gilbert and Professor Jose Pinto Gavea, who's a prolific researcher on topics such as mindfulness and compassion, and also from the University of Coimbra. Our chapter is titled Shame Memories That Shape Who We Are. The book is edited by Dr. James Kirby from the University of Queensland Compassionate Mind Research Group, along with Paul Gilbert, and is titled Making an Impact on Mental Health and Illness, The Applications of Psychological Research. I can't wait for it to come out, perhaps around September this year. Anyway, in there we've tried to elaborate on Professor Gilbert's evolutionary and biopsychosocial model of shame to incorporate the role that shame memories might also play. In particular, we explored shame memories and how they are traumatic autobiographical memories that are central to identity and can go on to influence external shame and internal shame throughout one's life as well as psychological well-being. So, there's my brief explainer of the evolutionary and biopsychosocial model of shame and shame memories. I hope that made a bit of sense. Do explore some of Professor Gilbert's writing on the topic and let me know if you'd like to hear when our chapter is published. Shame is such a tricky thing it hurts, and yet it's played such an important evolutionary role. Sometimes just knowing this and incorporating the model into your compassionate wisdom and your awareness and understanding of your own mind can help the pain to soften, even if just a little. And so, with our tricky brains and fancy words like biopsychosocial, floating around in our minds, I wish you all the very best on your compassionate journey.